Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about movies, about music. I'm David Lizabram. I'm Andy Keats. And we are here today to talk about Buena Vista Social Club, a film from 1999 directed by Vim Vendors. But before we get into that, um, you go to a fair number of concerts, Andy. I'd like to. I try to. <laughs> uh, how often do you go to a concert? And you feel like there are actual stakes for the musicians. Like it really matters if the show, you know, is not just an average show. I would say I feel that way. Maybe one out of like five or ten shows that I go to. But then I would also say that in retrospect, I realize that I've far overestimate that number in the moment. I mean, you go to a fair number of jam band concerts, I yeah. guess, and maybe because there's a lot of improvisation and stuff that that kind of makes the stakes higher or does it? I think it does. And I think the way that jam band fans follow jam bands about like the set list and excitement about what they're going to play and what they've been playing and bust outs all creates uh, like a, 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 a not just improvisation, but like a feeling of... Um, and it makes every show feel more like an event. Right. Now, the fact that it happens every night that way means, you know, like if you have champagne every night, it's not it's not for special occasions anymore. So I, I do think that probably in the moment, I, I, it's more that you I talk myself into there being more stakes than there actually are. Um, but I would still say that there's like. If there are event shows like for instance when i saw fish at baker's dozen that certainly felt like there were a lot of stakes at the new year's eve shows or halloween shows those certainly feel like there are a lot of stakes um but you know they they have they have off nights too and uh i imagine that those are those are uh shows that i don't think that they ever mail it in i don't think any musicians ever mail it in but i do think that there are, are nights that are it's just another night on the road I've seen shows where they definitely where they mailed, definitely it, mailed in. it in. I'm yeah. thinking of one particular Aerosmith show I saw back okay. in the 90s where I was like, as soon as they got on stage, it was clear that this was a transaction yeah. <laughs> and there was no love you know, between the audience or the band or anybody else. I'm one of many people who's had that experience with Modest Mouse. Oh, yeah. Modest Mouse. I've had that same feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I recall when I, the first time I went, I've mentioned this a, a few times on the show, first time I went to Bonnaroo convincing myself that this was like a really big deal for all of the musicians because right. it was a really big deal for me. Whereas I now recognize that probably for most musicians, like there's probably never a show with fewer stakes than like <laughs> a, fe a festival set where you only get 45 minutes. And most of the people there aren't necessarily there to see you and you have to play. You're kind of like a best of type deal. Right. I mean, I watched not long ago, the Billie Eilish documentary, which maybe we'll get to in a future episode, but, yeah. um, yeah, there, she was, I mean, she was really, her first album was just coming out. She's like 17, 16, and she was, you know, playing Coachella, and it really did seem like a big deal. You know, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. in her backyard, right? and, you know, this is the first time pretty much anybody had seen her live, like at least these people, and, um, you know, it, at least that documentary gave you the sense that there was real stakes there. I mean, I've seen Bruce Springsteen like a dozen times. He certainly is able to create the illusion he, that it is life or death up there. Springsteen certainly creates the the impression that every show is the most important one he's right. ever played. Yeah. Which, I, I mean, I think is true in a sense because he's insane. Um, <laughs> you yeah. know, whereas I've seen other musicians where it was like, clearly, you know, they're having a good time. But, you know, it's it it is what it is. Like you're paying to see Billy Joel and you get Billy Joel. Uh, but I mean... You know, seeing a small band in a club that's like trying to make it, that's, uh, you know, that that that's where it feels more real. Yeah, it does. Where like they can't afford bad shows. And maybe you know, part of the to grow every time, maybe part of the thing of like a musician who grows from that small clubs to like a bigger venue is like being able to always create that illusion yeah. or something. Yeah. But I mean, I went to a classical show the other day where the guy was playing, you know, a Beethoven, this piano player and. Uh, there were stakes just in the sense of the technical achievement was so impressive. Not that I'm some expert yeah. that it was clear. It was like just being able to pull this off. Yeah. Not that this guy probably messes up a lot, but still, it, it you know, the, it's such a high wire act to be able to do it that when it was done, when his piece was done, everybody was like, like there was the applause was 
was earned, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think a lot of uh, musicians also that have uh, really set regimented uh, sets where the, you know, the, there's a, there's a crowd participation section and it always happens at the same time and they know how to do it. I think they can really succeed in making people who are seeing them for the first time think that that's all spontaneous. Right. You know, um, that's the razzle dazzle Hollywood, the, the razzle, you know, yeah, exactly. It, and that's good. No, it's, it's fine. I mean, you know, I, I, I like seeing a band like fish, but I have no, <laughs> I, have, I have no, uh, impulse to like denigrate somebody who's like, no, no, no. We just play the same song every sh- show every night. Our encores are planned. It's, of course, you know, all that stuff. Right. It's Bob fine. Dylan's on tour right now. His set list does not vary night to night. He's 80 years old. Right. Just the fact that he gets up there and does it for two hours. Yeah. It on its own is, you know, is impressive. And I mean, he makes every show dif- different just because he's always done that. He doesn't know any other way to be. And it's like, boy, what is what are you going to get? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, so that, you know, that that's there's something to be said with the just like professionalism of, you know, a trooper who's been doing it and could just go out there and, you know, nail their nail their spot like a Tina Turner type. Probably like, right. you know, you know what you're going to get and she's going to deliver. Yeah. Petty. Yeah, Petty sure. Petty. Like yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, you know. The sometimes I'm there. I'm like, are we all just pretending to buy into this illusion that it matters? <laughs> yeah. Why are we even here, Andy? I, I feel that way sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's take a uh, trip to the island of Cuba, mm-hmm. as they say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to uh, my years of Spanish. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And talk about Buena Vista Social Club. Right. So what this, is this movie? So this is a movie that came a couple years after an album of the same name. Uh, about a group of Cuban musicians, uh, traditional uh, Cuban style music that had basically been lost even on the island uh, from the heyday of a club called the Buena Vista Social Club uh, in the 50s and was pulled back together when all of these musicians were in their 70s and 80s, put together in a studio uh, in part by a producer named Ry Cooter, who's a famous american musician uh and improbably that record sold millions of copies and won a grammy and became a real sensation and then a couple years later they uh sort of pulled the band back together had a concert at carnegie hall and that became the documentary that we're talking about today directed by finn vinners and you wouldn't necessarily know all of that from this movie Exactly. They don't tell you any of that backstory, really. I mean, you can gather it, I guess. They they talk about it a little bit, but without, like, all the setup. They sort of just presume that you go in with a certain amount of understanding or that you'll put it together on your own. But it does not begin with a title card that says, in 1996, Rye Cooter went to Cuba to uh, begin pulling together the, the lost musicians of of. Um, Cuban style music. You know. Yeah, it was. Uh, I had seen the movie in like ninety nine ish when mm-hmm. it came out, mm-hmm. and then watched it again twenty whatever years later, anticipating this podcast. I hadn't seen it. Yeah. In between, and it was very different than what I remembered. Yeah. I remember the record, and I remember the movie, but I conflated them in my head. Yeah. Like I thought this movie came out and introduced people, and then the record was a companion to the movie. That is how I remembered it, too. That's not what happened. No. But again, the movie doesn't really tell you that. It just kind of drops you in there. So just in terms of, like, picturing the scene, the movie, when I put it on, it's currently, you know, available on HBO, as we're speaking. Um, first of all, it's a Criterion Collection movie, which is the first and probably only rock talk <laughs> to get that, uh, you know, imprimatur, yeah. if that's a word I'm allowed to say, because I've never probably said it out loud before. Um <laughs> Which is the Criterion Collection is like a you know a, a basically a DVD the, a DVD company, but they pick like you know Citizen Kane and uh, Fellini, Godard, yeah, 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 the creme de la creme. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somehow History of the Eagles has not made it <laughs> onto the Criterion Collection. A but. Mistake, it should <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, so the movie starts and it's first of all it was shot on video. Yeah, you can tell from watching it. Yeah, it looks pretty cruddy. Yeah, uh, just to the modern eye. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it hasn't been really remastered. You know, I'm not sure what technology is available to remaster that, but I'm sure, you know, give Peter Jackson <laughs> a shot at it and it'll look like glorious, you know, 70 millimeter. Uh, but, um, you know, it looks, it looks pretty raw and, um, 
it's uh you know it's 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 very it's not very composed um you know the shots are just kind of caught um it seems like there was a very small crew um and uh, you know we're just dropped in basically with Ry Cooter this you know American guitar player cruising around Cuba talking to people occasionally recording a song um we get interviews with some of the artists um who are now many of them in their like at, at the time they were filming in their 80s or 90s yeah um who've you know kind of fallen off the map and are coming back so you get a little bit pieced together of that life story mm-hmm. but again yeah they're not really telling you hey we had this big hit album and uh we're getting a bit the band back together and here you go remember you listening to ibrahim ferrer on that album well here's what he looks like and let's hear what he has to say it's just it's it's sort of expected that you would already know the context right well, I think it, it. I think there is probably uh, an expectation that you would know the context, and it's and in that way, it's important to recognize that the movie came out after the album, and that the album was a sort of a phenomenon. Um, so that maybe that's why they were able to go in with that expectation. But I had another thought about why they did it that way, because at the very you know towards the very end of the movie, Ry Cooter tells the story basically about what he had intended to do. Uh, how he had come here in the 70s and had learned uh, about some of these musicians and those musicians that he learned about in the 70s were some of the people he was hoping to find when he came back. And Um, he didn't know if these people were alive. He, like, had had a cassette tape of some of these people playing. He didn't know all their names. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so, but what I think they did, and I'm guessing that this was intentional, by keeping that story from Ry Cooter until the end rather than putting up the beginning was to try to dance past. And I think successfully and rightly the concern about this being a movie about Ry Cooter and the imperial, like almost an, an imperialist concern. Right. I understand. Of, here's like, this white like, guy who came white, and rescued yeah. these poor Cuban guys on the street, basically. And, and you know, he's carpet bagged basically the, right. the, the, the Cuban music and, and put his name on it. Right. And, but they don't if even... You, if you but, have Ry Cooter at the beginning saying, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm doing, and it's like, you know, it's uh, like a, a heist movie where you're put, where Ry Cooter is, is Danny Ocean putting the gang together. <laughs> right. Then uh, Compay Sengundo is not the the main character at the beginning. Right. Ibrahim Farrar is not the main character at the beginning. Right. Uh, and so, like... I think the movie and the movie has still been criticized on those grounds to some extent uh, in Cuba. Um, and, and then, but I think that was mostly about the narrative about the Buena Vista social club, not necessarily like a criticism of this movie. Right. Um, yeah. But they don't even tell you until way into the movie that they're going to Carnegie hall. It's not like at the no. beginning of the movie, it's like, we're trying to get these guys together and get all the passports and everything together to to yeah. do this triumphant show at Carnegie Hall that these guys have all been dreaming of doing their whole lives. No. It's like late in the movie, it's like, maybe we should do Carnegie Hall, and yeah. then there they are. Uh, it's very offhand yeah, in terms so, of the way they approach things. So, like, the two clues that you get about, like, what is happening in the beginning is Kompai, who's this... Uh, he, uh, my understanding, is was quite famous. He, he was never somebody who was... Uh, sort of like lost right uh for a period he he was a, a very famous uh cowboy style guitarist basically right in uh in cuba he's 90 years old at this point and he's looking very dapper in a suit and he's driving around in a in a, a car um talking to people on the street about where the buena vista social club was right and there's no explanation about what he's asking about, what the Buena Vista Social Club is. It's all expected that you're going to pull that together with context. Right. And people tell him, oh, it's over here. No, it's over there. Oh, it's a house now. Um, what color is it? What color is the door? Um, and so, which I think is cool. It's clever. It's, it, it gives you this, like, scavenger hunt through, through Havana, basically. Um, and then the other little clue in the beginning is Ry Cooter does narrate a, uh, how he f- the, f- the first time he heard Ibrahim Farrar sing. Right. And he says, you know, that this guy came in and he was like a like a Nat King Cole right. character and he just started singing. We couldn't get enough of it. Right. Um, and so you, you can piece those two together and say, like, OK, they're finding these old musicians. There's this old club. 
Um, you know, some of the women on the street that he talks to, uh, Compay says, did you used to dance at the Buena Vista Social Club? So you can, you know, you can kind of put it together, but it's not a clean narrative, and they certainly aren't uh, explicitly spelling it out for you. Right, and even in the interview segments, which there's quite a few, and I think maybe, I mean, the music is great, so yeah. you got that. But, you know, other than that, the sort of best parts, you know, primarily of the movie, I think, are the these interviews yeah. uh, with, the, with the people. That are, I mean, they're catching them. <clears throat> these are not like interviews where they're, sitting in a studio and it's lit yeah. and there's a cinematographer and there's, you know, uh, the right kind of microphone. It's like they're in their little apartment, you know, with their little bed mm-hmm. and, or they're in on the street or in the park and people are walking by and talking and just living their lives. And, you know, it would really is like you just took a video camera and went down to Cuba and started talking to some people I, and yeah. they're sort of telling you their lives, but, th- but their life stories. Um, but again, it's I don't know if it's the editing or just th- that's what they got. But it's little fragments. Yeah. You know, here's oh, I was born here. Oh, my, I was very close to my mother. I learned piano this way. Yeah, that's I, my history with music, right? Right. Yeah. But it's but it's not, um, you know, it's not an organized thing. Like, okay, here are the talking points I want you to get to. You know, yeah. like you get in maybe a more contemporary mu- documentary. It, it's very, um, you know, you get what you get. Um, so here's, you know, Ibrahim Ferrer showing you his shrine yes. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and his house, his yeah. apartment, you see his, his apartment. Yeah. yeah. And his, you know, and it's all pretty run down. I mean, yeah. this is not, there's not a lot of glamour to be had in this movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, and there's not, I mean, the, the movie has a narrative structure. They're going to go to Carnegie hall to play this concert. And it's during the time when like the embargo was loosened for the first time and that's how they were able to do it in the first like there there could be a a narrative but more or less the movie is organized just with we're going to talk to this guy for a little bit he's going to tell us his story he's going to tell us about how we play music and then we're going to watch a performance where we see him play right and and it's kind of just going to link together and we're just going to do that for for two hours learning about all of these different people and Spending a lot of time with the music, much more than any, uh, I, I would say, more than any documentary we have ta- discussed this season, you get a lot of music. Yeah, and the music that you see, though, is <clears throat> these performances of the group all dressed up. One's in Amsterdam, one's at Carnegie Hall. There might be a few others. but And then there's a few studio clips, but you don't get – what you don't get is them performing in front of Cuban people. Yeah. You yeah. don't get any of that – Um. You know, I, I, w- I would love to see, like, uh, you know, older Cubans, yeah. you know, experiencing this and, and, and being taken back to their youth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get that with the musicians a little bit. You know, they're singing these songs that they've been singing since they were kids. Yeah. Um, and so you get that from them, but you don't get the uh, what relationship the actual C- Cuban people, yeah. um, you know, would have had. You don't get dancing. You don't really get a lot of that kind of experience. It's just... You're, you know, seeing a big fancy auditorium yeah. in Europe or in the U.S. Um, and all these people dressed up to perform for an audience that's otherwise unfamiliar to them. Yeah, there's the um, basically the only being you know, a uh, reaction by Cuban people to the music that are, that is in it is like a few times they walk through the streets singing. Right. Um, Om- Omara as uh, the the. Um, only woman really who's in in the movie um basically she she sings at one point and she's singing a traditional song and some people on the street know it and sing right. along with her and she like and th- that that really comes to life and that, that that's a that's a cool scene but you're right they they don't play a concert to cuban people yeah um the um the I, I want to talk a little bit about Ry Cooter and who yeah. he is and Vim Vanders a little bit. Yeah. Um, Vim Vanders um, is a German director who kind of came of the came of the came of age in the 70s. Like there was kind of a German new wave mm-hmm. of filmmaking. And he came to Hollywood or came to the U.S. in the 80s. He made a movie called Paris, Texas. That was kind of his breakout, quote unquote, movie. Um, it stars um, Dean Stockwell. Uh, late R.I.P. Uh, and Harry Dean Stanton, who's um, a frequent rock dog's appearance. Yes, uh, appears in Dig. Yes, uh, appears in Dig. Uh, a party by the yeah, Brian Jonestown Massacre. Exactly, exactly. He's involved in the Rolling Thunder 
review, I think, as well. So, um, you know, so we, so he's a regular, he's a regular guest, um, friend of the pod. Uh, <laughs> um, but he, um, they play brothers uh, in this movie, and 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 um, it's a very abstract, um, very kind of. Um, very beautiful meditative movie with these great like southern landscapes and um the Ry Cooter did the music for the movie mm. um the cinematographer for Paris Texas was Robbie Mueller a German cinematographer who also filmed Buena Vista Social Club although they look completely different mm-hmm. um I mean Vim Vender's whole thing is um sort of abstract filmmaking even his quote-unquote narrative films um are uh, you know, t- tend to be, um, not direct. Um, you know, it's not Hollywoody. It's not like, here's the plot points, you know, everybody, here we go. It's, mm-hmm. it's, um, just kind of leading you on a journey through visuals and music. Um, and Ry Cooter, his sometime collaborator was a guitar player who, um, came up in the sixties and did a lot of session work he played with tons of big, I mean, he played with the Stones, Stones and yeah, them like Sticky Fingers. Right? Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he at some point there was consideration for him to join the Rolling Stones, I think, mm-hmm. after um, Mick Taylor left. And um, although he's an American, so I guess that was ar- arguably the reason why it didn't work out. I don't know if he really had that Rolling Stones vibe to him. He seems much more self effacing. Yeah. Um, but he's an incredible guitar player. There's no, there's no doubt that he's up there. Um, and slide guitar specifically. Yeah. Slide guitar, uh, country folk style. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had really great solo albums in the seventies. Um, and they just kind of like, didn't really want to do the rock star thing mm-hmm. and kind of went off to do film scores and different kinds of experimental things and just kind of landed into this situation. Um, his son is also in this movie. Yeah. His son, Joaquim, who's maybe in his twenties. He's a percussionist. Um, so the whole time it's, I mean, when you see the concert footage, um, it's all these Cuban musicians mm-hmm. and then Ry Cooter playing slide guitar and then Joaquin playing percussion. And I guess that leads me to ask, do we really need a lot Ry Cooter playing bluesy slide over these songs? No, I, I, I think it, it is unclear exactly what he's bringing to, to, to this situation i mean it's they're playing sewn music is the 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 name of the style right according to right right cooter and it's this style that's been lost really and uh, even in cuba it, it it is not really played anymore at the time of this movie and the value is bringing these these legends of that style back together to play and it's not exactly clear why Ry Cooter needs to be on stage or why his son needs to be on stage. I mean, it's all they're playing all acoustic music. It's stand up bass, guitar. They, and, and yeah. The other guys, to be clear, seem to like playing with him. Yeah. You know, they're, they're all they're, down with Ry. They're Rye. all down with Ry. There doesn't seem to be a, like, you know, there's scenes with uh, Kompai and uh, and uh, and Ry Cooter jamming together. Yeah. And they're cracking each other up. They're, you know, they're playing different licks that just make each other laugh because they have this sort of uh, shared vernacular on the guitar, basically. Um, the, the, the type of guitar that Compe plays is called a trace. Right. It's like a, a little six-string guitar. Yeah. That you play almost percussively. Right. And Ry Cooter basically said that he learned to play it once he got to Cuba and got to know Compay, and he was really he was really invigorated by it because it was a new way to play. Right. Um, so I get what why why Ry Cooter's into it. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't but necessarily know. They're why all we playing. Did. They're all playing these acoustic instruments, mm-hmm. piano, you know, trumpet, whatever. And then he's sitting up there with an electric Stratocaster yeah. and a you know amp playing slide primarily. Yeah. Sometimes just finger style, but uh, again, it just I mean Joaquin hangs with him in the percussion department. I got no you know beef with Joaquin. He's yeah. jamming away back there. Uh, cool um but just sometimes i'm like we do we, it's cool that you brought these people together but maybe just like be the producer and hang back like do we need you there but i mean i don't know if he was a selling point like it's not like he's some big star no it's not like he's some big star um okay so a couple things to get to on this one uh i think the guy who is short shrifted on time in this documentary is marcos gonzalez he's the the band leader yeah Ry Cooter is not the band leader. Marcos Gonzalez is. He's a, a younger Cuban musician. And based on interviews I listened to and read, uh, particularly a Ry Cooter interview um, with 
uh, Terry Gross from the time that this movie came out. Marcos Gonzalez is the one who's able to locate all of these musicians. He's the one who knows them and knows where to find them and knows who to talk to to help find them if he doesn't. So it's not quite true that Ry Cooter is the one going through Havana and finding Ibrahim Ferrer or Ruben Gonzalez. It's really Marcos Gonzalez who is doing that. And he he's on stage. He's featured prominently. He, you can tell that he's directing the action on stage with everybody. And he has a few moments where he talks about different musicians. But he seems like much more of a central character in pulling this album off, pulling these concerts off, than Ry Cooter, frankly. And you don't get that vision. You don't pick that up if you just watch the movie. Yeah, I feel like if if they made this movie in 2021, yeah. Ry Cooter would probably not be on the stage with these people. I so, yeah. And I don't mean that in like, I mean, probably that's just like a different way of looking at things now but for me personally just in terms of the music i feel like that would not it wouldn't have suffered um but i like music yeah. Right? yeah and i guess looking back maybe for me like i went and saw this movie when it came out and i checked out the cd and i was into it yeah. i mean maybe for 20 something year old dave lizabram in the late 90s like hey here's Ry Cooter. he's jamming with all these great cube musicians like that was a, i guess a selling point to me right so maybe that it worked yeah. And, you know, so it's kind of I feel like we're maybe imposing contemporary values on the ancient times of 1999. It's possible. And also the um, the context of this is in 1994, Ry Cooter makes um, an album talking to Timbuktu with Ali Fakatore. Right. Uh, Pakistani. Mali. Right? Mali. Oh, Mali. oh, right. OK. Thinking uh, of something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Malian uh, guitarist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was also a hit. And is a you know a huge album in the um, right world music category, right? Right. Um, so huge in that world. Um, and the the original premise for this album was not let's go get together these old musicians from the Cuban style that have been lost. It was let's get these Cuban guys together along with these. Uh, musicians from Mali and who were influenced by Afro-Cuban music and put them all together. Hmm. And then the, all the musicians from Mali were unable to get visas to travel. Huh. And so that part of the project just fell apart, but they had already assembled all of the Cubans. Hmm. And so they're like in the studio with all of these Cuban musicians and they just start playing and recording they happen to be great musicians and who know this, all these awesome songs and then the, and, so, and so this came to life and you didn't need it and it's interesting because in retrospect like it's too complicated you don't you don't no one knows about the cuban musicians you don't need to add african a, musicians the african musicians on top of it just introducing the world to the cuban musicians is plenty it turns out that it way tu- it turns out that way and and you know uh, I think, you know, bringing over some influential musicians from Mali would be like a great sequel. Sure. A follow up album, you know, but it actually seems to work out just fine to just introduce people to this uh, lost style. And so I think, you know, all of that context maybe helps explain why R- Ry Cooter's there more is that like he was the connection to Mali. He was he had he was he had traveled to Cuba in the 70s and had this idea uh, but again, it doesn't necessarily explain why he needs to be on stage. There was a whole thing in the eighties and nineties of, I mean, white American musicians or white European, whatever yeah. musicians, English speaking, who were like out there doing their thing, like in the world music scene, like, yeah. Hey, check this out. I mean, Graceland is certainly the biggest sure. example, but you got Peter Gabriel, uh, you know, and, and you've got Ry Cooter on a, maybe on a smaller scale, although this ended up blowing up and, uh, David Byrne, certainly, mm-hmm. um, big on that, um, uh, with his, the Wacabop label, like always going out and finding people from Brazil and other people. And it was kind of the early days of Starbucks and that whole scene. Yeah. There was always, yeah, you could buy world music albums or, Starbucks. you know, Borders bookstore was big and these things were always like there. It was like, if you were a certain kind of upper, upper middle class, you know, educated, yeah. whatever, uh, who, you know, maybe you're, you know, kind of 
listen to rock music in the 60s and 70s and now it's kind of passed you by and you're not into the the limp biscuits of the world or whatever <laughs> see our woodstock 99 <laughs> episode for that um this was a thing you could you know this was a cd you could buy and throw in the cd changer and uh you know your kids could listen to it and you and your you know spouse could you know could groove to it yeah totally it was it was normal to have like a middle a middle-aged suburbanite who like had a world music collection right you know and they weren't especially hip or anything right right sure um and also the 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 concern around like carpet bagging was pronounced around that time too that that hasn't come later right um, there's a famous story that what uh, paul mccartney recorded band on the run in uh, jamaica no lagos oh lagos right right in lagos and fela kute hears that mccartney's there recording the album and goes to confront him and say you're gonna steal our sound to which mccartney has to like calm him down and explain I'm just here to record because I like it here. Come, come listen to the come listen to the masters. You'll see. I'm not taking <laughs> right. I'm not taking the Afrobeat sound. <laughs> Band on the Run is not an Afrobeat album. No, and so and Fela Kuté uh, comes and listens, and they have a great time. And I think Paul McCartney uh, said that he like smoked the best weed of his life. With, right with Fela Kuté. Right went to right. his club. Right went to his club. Right. So. Um, Yes, that's all around at this time. Um, yeah. He, yeah, so, so I mean, again, I'm not dogging on Ry Cooter for being into Cuban music or anything else or for putting this together or playing his role. Yeah. Um, enough respect to Ry Cooter. I just feel like musically he's not bringing a lot to the table here. Uh, he wouldn't be missed. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of selling point no longer is necessary. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it holds up. I don't know. Yeah. I, I I kind of have weird f- vibes about this whole movie, if I'm yeah. being honest. Yeah. I kind of feel like... S- spell it out a little bit more. I'm not trying to play the heel here. Yeah. And Lord knows, I, who, who far be it for me to second guess the Criterion Collection. Yeah. Uh, I feel like uh, the music is good. Uh-huh. The interviews are good, I guess. Uh, it kind of looks like crap, but that's maybe an art, you know, just an artifact of the time. Yeah. Um, but I just don't, you know, I kind of feel like you can put on the CD uh, or stream it now, whatever, and it's cool. And uh, you get the music. And I mean, it's cool to see these people, but it doesn't, I don't know if this like hangs together as a movie. Okay. And I'm I'm into Vim Vendors and I get like abstract filmmaking, you know, I'm not opposed to like a, a you well, know, a loose narrative. Though. Well, I'm saying, but, I, yeah, you know, yeah. a movie doesn't have to be like, here is the plot or a, a documentary doesn't have to be like spelling it all out for me, for me to dig it. Yeah. I'm not sure though, that this, there's enough intentionality here to, to carry it through. All right. So a couple things I'll say in defense of the movie. One is uh compai's uh, hangover cart here, which is to take a chicken neck, mm. fry it in a pan. Yes. When it's no longer bloody, throw a handful of garlic in it. Uh huh. And then eat that. <laughs> have you, in fact, tried this? <laughs> I have not. Uh, Kompai also later says... Should we have a Kompai uh, hangover cure uh, uh, yeah. Rock Docs <laughs> live stream? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about like we all get together. <laughs> see how that works. Yeah. yeah. He also uh, describes that when he was five years old, uh, his uh, grandmother would have him light her cigars for him. Mm. And that he would put them in her mouth, light the cigar, hand it over to her. And uh, so you could say that that he has been smoking cigars for 85 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what he says. So I would say that both of those stories uh, cut against your complaints of the film. They, I, they on them on their own are, are worth the price of admission. You're leaving on the table his his thoughts about uh, um, parenting. Yes. <laughs> he says, I'm 90 years old. I have, I think he says five kids, but he makes it clear that he's not done <laughs> yes. and that he has the goods yes. <laughs> to, right. to, to, uh, to make it happen. That is right. And he's, he's out there like ladies. <laughs> um, so this doesn't fit into anything we're talking about, but, uh, Ruben Gonzalez, the pianist. So there's, there's three guys when they, as they go through the movie, each time they talk to a new musician, the, 
each new musician seems to speak in, in reverent terms about Ibram Ferrer, Compay Segundo, and Ruben Gonzalez, yeah. the, the pianist. Yes. The story about Ruben Gonzalez is crazy. Yeah. When they got down there, uh, uh, Marcos Gonzalez, who was putting them all together, told him, told them that he was dead. Right. That Ruben Gonzalez was dead. That Ruben Gonzalez was dead. Everyone thought he was dead. And they talked to more people, and they're like, no, 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 he's not dead. He just has arthritis, and he can't play piano anymore. Right. He's alive. And they go find him, and he basically says, fine, he says, no, I can play, but I don't have a piano. <laughs> right. So I haven't played in 20 years. This is a guy who had, had made big records in Cuba in, like, the yes. 50s. Yes, was a, a famous person. Right. Or, famous musician uh and so he just starts playing again and he's be, you know he probably takes some time to get the muscles back and get your you know get your fingers back but he he it's reawakened in him and he has this second life as a, a as you know the he gets to go on this essentially legendary tour at the end you also he see him after his fame. you also see him playing a cole porter tune on a piano for a little kids ballet class yes like he's, I don't. It wasn't clear if that's a paying gig for him, yeah. or if he just happened to like be there and there's a piano and he's playing and then these little girls are in their tutus or yeah. playing or whatever people do in ballet. So a big question I had that was not explained in the movie in, ter- in terms of things that could use some some explicit narration. Why is it that this music disappeared in Cuba? The blockade explains why we don't know this music or these musicians. But why is it that the Buena Vista Social Club couldn't continue being a place where Cubans went to see music? Or why this music didn't exist at all? Like what they're really treating it, they're explaining to us that this is this is lost, they're finding these people in their eighties, they're performing together for the first time in a long time. Ibrahim Ferrar had been retired, he didn't sing at all for a very long time. Why in Cuba didn't it last? So the, what I got from my extensive research, which you know I often do, um, was that this uh, style of music was very popular during the Batista government. And that when the Castro regime came in, they suppressed this type of music because it was – I don't know if it's a class or type of thing or it was just associated with a previous era. So they wanted to bring in something new. Uh, or, or you know, it's kind of like a combination of like American type jazz mm-hmm. um, mixed with traditional Cuban folk type music. So maybe, you know, it wasn't authentic enough or it was too American or something like that. I never really got the sense of that. But I think it's clear that, as you know, in the Rock Docs extended universe, there are villains. Yes. Right. Um, and I hate to say I'm going to I'm going to have to turn in my dirtbag left card, but I think. Castro is one of those villains. <laughs> He's in the pantheon. Um, so Ron Cooter's explanation was was less political. He basically just said that when salsa ascended in Cuba and the rest of the Caribbean, this music just began seen as de classe. Hmm. So I've read different things. So that's interesting. Um, and then he also his his characterization of what like song music is is very similar to yours. But he basically said that it was like a nineteenth century. Spanish and French melody on top of a African rhythm section. Right. And so you, you get this like European harmonic quality on top of a African rhythm. Right. And okay. That's what song music is. But that's basically what you said. That's also what jazz is. That's what jazz is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, he, uh, Ruben Gonzalez told, um, told uh, Ry Cooter that um, Jelly Roll Morton took his sound <laughs> from Cubans who went to New Orleans after uh, the Spanish-American War. So we're talking about dudes who are old <laughs> back in 1999 yeah. or thereabouts. And most of them are dead now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, R.I.P. Point of Vista Social Club. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. I, I can't really speak for Jolly Roll Moulton. He had a lot of – Jolly Roll Moulton is an interesting character. He, um, I mean, basically, he claimed to invent everything. Um, to the rest of his life. And he actually lived a long time. I mean, there's like, you know, I think from the sixties are still recordings of him. Um, you know, even though he was like around new Orleans at the, you know, the, the early 
days of King Oliver, Louis Armstrong. But he, yeah, I mean, if anytime they interviewed him, everybody ripped him off. You know, Duke Ellington ripped him off, Louis Armstrong. So, yeah, I mean, you know, he could probably take a, you know, a little shot like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that there is good stuff in this movie. And certainly the musical sequences, when they're performing, whether it's in the studio, in concert, whatever, is like, damn. When they're playing dominoes, also great. Uh, yeah. Great scene. <laughs> There's good stuff in the movie, yes, yes. but you can have a lot of good stuff and have it not cohere yeah. into a film that makes sense as a hour and 40 minute experience or whatever. Yeah. And I kind of got that feeling from this. But yeah, that's interesting. It, it, it's interesting that you had the same sense that I did about this movie coming first. As right. As opposed to the album, which was completely my experience. And that was just not true <laughs> i don't know why where we both got that but the the narrative around the whole project really did take off you know like i think people describe this as like ry cooter goes to cuba and and assembles a group of cuban musicians and they throw a concert right um and so that we we just passed the 25 year anniversary of the recording of the album right so there have been a, a, a run of pieces written. I uh, listened to an interview with Judy Cantor Navis. She's a, a Spanish music critic who's uh, written a lot about Cuban music. Mm-hmm. And she, she did say that in Cuba, this became that narrative. Not, not necessarily the movie and not necessarily the album, but certainly the narrative around them became quite controversial um, about them and became sort of a discussion of American imperialism. And that now the the new releases, the new remasters really go out of their way to focus on the brilliance of these musicians as opposed to Ry Cooter and the project of reassembling them. Yeah, I mean, a thing I have no sense of at all is how this whole project was received popularly in Cuba at the time yeah. or now. Like, yeah. I, did it, it was did completely it opaque to, to me. Yeah, right, right, right. They don't talk about it. Did it lead to a lasting rediscovery of this music. Is this music now popular again in Cuba, for instance? Right. I mean, I don't know. It's 25 years later. Right. It could have been, and then time goes on. Yeah. Another thing that's interesting in the movie is the end, when they go to Carnegie Hall, Mm -hmm. first you see them hanging around New York, like Midtown. Yeah. And that's a really different thing, because it's a real fish-out-of-water situation where they're, like, looking in the window of some gift shop Yes. And they're looking at, and this they're, is. They're trying to identify all the like little character toys. Yeah, there. First of all, there's these like, there's these types of sculptures that they used to sell at like gift shops in New York that I don't think exist anymore. But it was like my grandfather had a lot of this stuff. Like he had some of these exact things, I think. And there are these like kind of ceramic, uh, caricature type sculptures that are maybe like a foot high of celebrities. So there's first there's like they see Laurel and Hardy and that. Like, who is that again? It's like, oh, yeah, El Flaco and El Gordo, you know, the skinny guy and the fat guy. I guess that's what they were called, you know. And um, and then there's like, you know, president. So there's like, you know, Bill Clinton playing the saxophone and, and they see John Kennedy and they're trying to remember who that is, yeah. which I was like, I thought like I thought in Cuba they would be like banging on all the time about how America is so evil. So like the president of America, especially Kennedy, <laughs> of all people, um, would be like a villain. But maybe these people just were not clocking into the news yeah well they, but i think they i think it might just be memory right like, what was the they're also really old yeah and they're just saying well what was his name again yeah. also in the beginning they uh, it's in just a, you know, a linguistic thing that they refer to the october missile crisis oh okay which obviously they right. wouldn't call it the cuban missile crisis in cuba mm, right thanks <laughs> yeah it's just the local missile crisis <laughs> that we had down the street right <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like well really it was in the bay it wasn't really in cuba yeah, yeah. i mean the ships never got there yeah, yeah. <laughs> it turned around yeah no, the stuff in new york's interesting though i think it's it's uh ibram farrow right who's just t- looking around he's just like i wish my wife could see this this is so beautiful i want to come here with my i want to come here with my family yeah they're really into it they're really into it but uh, then they go up <laughs> to the Empire State Building and they're looking at the Statue of Liberty from the like, you know, and, and they're like, 
Well, that's not the Statue of Liberty. It's much bigger. This yeah. is this little one on this island. It wouldn't just be sitting on some island. Buildings and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're sort of mystified by it. Which right. I actually think is, is, is cool because, in my impression, in, in my estimation, almost every tourist attraction like that is unimpressive when you actually see it. Right. Well, if you see the Statue of Liberty from far away. If you go there, it's big. Yeah, sure. But, you know, like, I don't know. When I went to Mount Rushmore. Right. It's just like, hmm. Here we are. All right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like seeing a, you're expecting them to be like, you know, oh, I can't believe I got to come to New York to play Carnegie Hall, and they're just like, well, that can't be it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that, but that, that does give you the different. All this stuff gives you a different perspective of like people who are not American, mm-hmm. who don't think, don't spend all their time thinking about America and how great we are, and all of our presidents and various statuary and all that stuff. Yes. But they did kind of come off a little bit like rubes. Sure. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I know these people primarily are not, you know, they're these are not college educated, you know, people that are from some upper oh, class. Mean, like, they're, did they have to include that? Yeah, it's like, you know, that's yeah. that, you know, they're just working class people that their job was being a musician for the most part, especially yeah. for the last so many years after the music was no longer popular. Yeah. That w- and uh, e- even at its height, um, Ryan Cooter did say that like playing this type of music was uh, oh, this was a working class thing to do right have another job even if you were famous doing this right Which, interesting and different yeah it's just a different kind of uh really circumstance to music yeah, and it, it it the way he describes it is basically there was no such thing as a business of music in cuba mm. even at the height of this it was it, it, it was an art that you that was it was an art for working class people right and probably yeah yeah, it was like I can get paid to play piano on a Friday night as opposed to laying bricks or something. Great, yeah. you know. It wasn't, you know, they they weren't like there was, there was no model of being a rich, famous rock star. Right. So, um, what? Uh, I guess I mean I guess I guess I've kind of told you my my thoughts about it yeah. in terms of like, I mean I don't know I I I, I guess um, I'm more inclined to listen to the music than watch the movie. Yeah, I think that's right. I was when I had it on, I was trying to talk my wife into sitting down and watching a little bit of it with me, just because I presumed that she would like the music. I, I right. presume that most people exposed to this music would almost immediately like it. Right. It's it's really really catchy and impressive right away. Absolutely, everybody who's in this movie can sing like an absolute dove. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and so I I guess I. I the, what I was thinking is just how peculiar it is that this became such a phenomenon. Right. I mean, it, this happens from time to time where something that's totally unexpected just becomes a, a hit. Right. Um, but it, it's just very interesting to me that, that this rediscovery of, of old-fashioned Cuban music sold millions of copies in the late 19... 19- yeah, I mean, in a way, it's different from how we we are today because we're so fragmented. I mean, in those days, it was still sort of a monoculture. A so, like, hit in any right, genre. Gregorian chant could become huge for like a minute, or and then the, this you know music from Cuba was big, Enya. and then yeah, Enya, <laughs> and then for like a minute, it was like swing dancing. Swing dancing. That you know that was the that was kind of a thing going on in the '90s where you know you still had this last gasp of this like empire mass culture. Yeah. Um, whereas now things can become huge, like some random, you know, music from it anywhere in the world can become really big on TikTok and millions of people are watching it. So it's not that uh, things can't become popular and well-known and successful now, but it doesn't break through for better or worse to like the quote unquote mainstream in the way, you know, that things did back then where it was just inescapable. Yeah. Like this is a, a dumb reference, but just as a point of comparison in, uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall, they, they're, there's like a joke where somebody's wearing, he's trying to pull off a, a, a hat. Right. And they say, you look like you're in the Buena Vista Social Club. Mm. Like, this was popular enough that a mainstream blockbuster lowest common denominator comedy. Like five years later. Five years later could like just drop a, a reference to it. Right. And trust that most people would get it. Right. You know? And maybe they meant it to, to, to be a nod and a wink and feel cool that they get it or whatever yeah but still but still it's in that movie right is and i don't know you you've talked a lot on the show about like jobs that don't exist anymore like being the biggest rock star in the world right 
And I, I kind of think that there's like a, a bit of this phenomenon doesn't exist anymore. Like breakthrough hits from some genre that just become huge don't just don't really seem part of what we do anymore. Yeah, I mean, I hear, I do hear about like some song from some country in Africa. Yeah. All of a sudden is trending right now on TikTok, and you know, millions of young girls in America are doing a dance to it or something. I'm not going to be exposed to it. Even if I go on TikTok, which I typically don't, uh, because I'm old, um, <laughs> um, like it wouldn't be served to me. It wouldn't, be, I'm not the audience. And so, you know, it, we just don't work that way anymore. You know, where it's like, well, everybody tunes into 60 minutes and they're talking about this album with Ry Cooter and some, you know, some musicians and your, you know, your parents are going to hear about it and it's just going to, you can't escape it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So do you think, I mean, would you do, would you recommend this movie to somebody? Well, not after hearing how you feel about it. I mean, it. come on. <laughs> you can have your own opinion. Uh, I would. I, th- I mean, I think I think your point is well taken, though, that you might as well just recommend the album. Right. That's basically what you're recommending by recommending the movie. Yes. And uh, But I don't know. I think people would like seeing Cuba, right? And, and uh, Cuba at this time. I so yeah I think I think I would I would still I would still recommend this movie to people I think it holds up and I think um, the Ry Cooter stuff does hang over it that it, it, it's a little bit weird that there's always this white guy on stage and and that um, I think they rightfully pull him back quite a bit there's not he's not like that frequent of a presence um, which I think keeps it from becoming too big of a problem. But I do think that that would be something that peop- that a lot of people would pick up on watching it today. Well, here's what I'm going to recommend. Yeah. If you like Vim Vendors, Ry Cooter, Robbie Mueller, yeah. the people behind this movie, I recommend you watch Paris, Texas. It's a two and a half hour, very slow uh, journey into the heart of loneliness, alienation, regret. And it is a blast. <laughs> I love this movie. Okay. I've watched it many times. I'm not selling it well, but it is so good. Uh, and it's wonderful and it's beautiful. The music is great. Uh, the ca- performances are unbelievably compelling and charming in their own very offbeat way. Uh, so do that. Listen to the Buena Vista Social Club CD. Down, Down with the Castro regime. Down with, okay. But up with Cuba. Up with Cuba. Up with Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, Lyndon Johnson. Cool. <laughs> We're we gonna run it down. We've taken a, an extremely <laughs> political turn. <laughs> Underrated. Uh, okay. Uh, and um, those are our heroes and villains of the week for Rock Docs. And uh, there you go. This has been Rock Docs.